It's Riff Arcade. I'm Butts, and this is Let's Plato, the show that looks into the social, historical, and philosophical themes of your favorite games. I want to say right up front that I'm probably not good at games, and I don't have a degree in philosophy, but I hope this video will inspire you to look into these topics and games for yourself. We try to stay neutral to certain topics at Riff Arcade, and while I will do my best to maintain that, some personal opinions might slip through. Please enjoy, and be aware, spoilers incoming. Today, we welcome our robot overlords with Deck 13 Interactive's The Surge. Deck 13 wanted to put a sci-fi spin on Dark Souls. The mechanics and combat are lifted straight from the Souls games, and Deck 13 made sure the story was as divorced from reality as any Souls game. You know, really let the player enjoy the escapism. Anyway, The Surge is about an all-encompassing corporation that causes ecological collapse, and is desperately trying to use automation and class exploitation to correct their damage while turning a profit. <sighs> it's like an edgy, goth version of Wally. -E. You play as Warren, a guy looking for a job at Creo. You're given a sweet exosuit to help perform your industrial tasks, but a mysterious power surge sabotages Creo making everyone go completely crazy. It's up to you to figure out why. Well, the Surge isn't a well-known game, but it does what it sets out to do very well. Cool sci-fi gadgets? Check. Lose all progress at death? Check. Endurance bar combat? Check. Bleak, hopeless story and characters? Check. Seriously, do not play this game if you're anxious about the future. It is brutal. But Deck 13 went so brutal with their story that they made something more than just a Souls copy. I don't think they meant to, but in trying to craft a Souls-like version of the future, Deck 13 actually made the greatest Gunther Anders game of all time. If you've never heard of Gunther Anders, that's because you're a well-adjusted human being who doesn't take philosophy classes for fun. <sighs> this episode's gonna be a little grim. So if you're nervous about the future, eh, you might want to look away. But let's see how The Surge and Gunther Anders are telling us how it's too late. The machines have already won. Gunther Sigmund Stern was born in Wrocław, Poland in 1902. I'll get to the name thing in a sec, just stick with me. His family was Jewish, and his parents, William and Clara Stern, were groundbreaking child psychologists. In fact, Gunter and his sisters, Gilda and Eva, were studied by their parents. William and Clara took extensive notes about their kids, everything from how they learned speech, to memory recalling, storytelling, and moral development. I desperately want to know if they kept tabs on who was tattling on each other. The Stearns put all this together into what they called Game Theory, which describes the necessity of play to a child's development. It took 18 years of extensive research to figure out kids should have fun to grow up better. Gunter earned a PhD in philosophy in 1923, studying under Martin Heidegger. He's been associated with the Frankfurt School, a school of critical thought at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. This is just a collaboration of like-minded academics and not, despite what I first thought when I heard about it, a school teaching bratwurst recipes. <sighs> Someday, though. These nerds took a look at the thoughts of writers like Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, and Friedrich Hegel, and thought, hey, why isn't everything better by now? They thought that there must be some other factors keeping society from improving. Otherwise, the blueprint of these earlier writers would have worked out by now. As a side note, most of these men were German and Jewish, and a lot of their work happened before the 1930s. This was a time in Germany when anti-Semitism was low, and being Jewish wasn't seen as a problem. But starting in the 30s, it became a problem. Case in point, Gunter started his professional career as a journalist, but his editor thought there were too many Jewish-sounding names in the paper already. So Gunter changed his last name to Anders. Ah, here comes the grim. Anders fled Nazi Germany in 1933 to France, and then to the U.S. 
He would return to Europe in the 1950s to live with his wife in Vienna, where Anders would live until his death in 1992. Ugh, one year shy of Jurassic Park. Ugh, poor guy. Anders' most famous work is a collection of essays and letters titled The Obsolescence of Human Beings. There are two big themes, the inability of humans to picture their own destruction and our feelings of inadequacy compared to our creations. Anders talks about how the industrial age created a gap between the capacity of individuals to produce machines and their ability to imagine and deal with the consequences caused by those machines. In ancient warfare, a soldier could probably kill five to six people in hand-to-hand -hand battle. With a gun, a single soldier could kill dozens. With atomic weapons, a small group of scientists and engineers can kill thousands. And while every individual soldier knows exactly how their gun works, no single scientist or engineer can describe every working of an atomic bomb. It's just too complicated. Even the outcome cannot be described. A single bullet can kill a single person, but try to picture in detail the full totality of an atomic bombing. You can't. And how do we respond to it? Just in the same way we respond to newspaper reports. Not at all. And why do we not react? Out of courage? Out of stoicism? Out of lack of imagination? because we are apocalyptically blind. This gap between what we can imagine and what we can actually do is not the only gap. In fact, Anders had to invent a new feeling to describe how people feel when comparing themselves to technology. This new feeling he created was called, wait, you could do that? You just make up a new feeling? Oh, this makes me feel all spurgly. He called his feeling Promethean shame. Have you ever left your house without your cell phone and just felt naked without it? When we delegate tasks to machines, and then those machines are taken away, we see how inadequate we are compared to those machines. The more technology allows us to do, the less we notice the work it does, and the more we feel at a loss without it. When you use Google Maps to get from point A to point B, you feel accomplished for using your phone to get there. You see, in that moment, the phone as an extension of yourself. But the phone did all the work. Without it, you couldn't have even taken a single step towards point B. And you might have a vague idea how Google Maps works with satellites and GPS and, I don't know, numbers? There are probably numbers and all. But you don't really know how it works, it just does. And that feeling of disempowerment without your phone is Promethean shame. We feel Shame when confronted by the humiliatingly high quality of fabricated things. Anders thought that we see ourselves as rough drafts in a world of final copies. We are flawed, squishy, fragile, limited beings, while the things we design and make are sleek, efficient, sturdy, durable, and unlimited in number. Even the claim that we made them is missing the point. If anyone had a right to employ such a we, then it would be the minority of researchers, inventors, and experts who truly mastered these mysterious realms. We use machines to handle more and more of our tasks. But by offloading those tasks to machines, we are giving up control to those machines and, more specifically, a smaller and smaller group of people who design and program those machines. When we let Amazon recommend products to us, we are letting a small group of programmers determine what we like. Perhaps they'll be right and we'll enjoy the product, but the point is, the more machines run our lives, the more our lives are governed by those who run those machines. Who am I, anyhow? The Prometheus of today asks while playing Jester at the court of his own machines. Who am I, anyhow? So how does this relate to the Surge? The game is constantly reinforcing the idea that you are just a fragile, squishy person and you can't possibly compete with machines. In other RPGs, you grind to find better equipment or skills, but in The Surge, you kill enemies to take their machines to upgrade your own rig. In the first cutscene, they whisk you away to add an exosuit to you, 
Heck, even before that happens, you're shown to be using a wheelchair. You start the game dependent on a machine, and you only become more dependent from there. Audio logs talk about pressuring employees to take mechanical enhancements. We've had issues with Robert Weave again, this time about the exoskeleton program. He's refused to have the implant surgery. And we've explained it's hardly invasive, even offered to double his bonus. But no, it thinks management will use it to control the workforce. And he even brought up his union nonsense again. If he poisons the others, it could put us months behind schedule. It's amazing. He doesn't see it as making his job easier. Enhancements that are seen as prevalent as a work uniform. My guys have been relying on their implants, but I'm noticing increasingly erratic behavior from them. This schedule was meant to be temporary, but it's been months now with no sign of respite. Now, I don't blame my team for using, but the side effects are becoming increasingly apparent. There's even been fights, and, you know, some people are just acting downright weird. And we're going to have big problems soon if something isn't done, and I, I won't be held responsible. Later in the game, you meet a researcher who wants to solve the climate problem by combining humans and machines. But I'm trying to save mankind here, not just the species. No, I'm trying to save all of us. We're flawed, incomplete. We're not yet prepared to re-enter paradise, you see. We wouldn't survive. My homo machinalis could change that. They are the living proof that we could be more than human. We, all of us, could fill the world of tomorrow. Ascended beings in a new utopia. The entire game drills Implanting Neuralink. Promethean shame into your head. At Creo, humans are expendable, and the machines are what need protecting. You know this stuff is toxic, right? We can't just keep dumping it wherever on the facility. We've had another accident. Well, thank God he's only a cripple. Or uh, is it cheaper for the company if they're killed outright? Listen, if the EHA ever heard of any of these incidents, we'd be closed down faster than one of those rockets goes up. Blurring the line between man and machine isn't the only confusion the surge relates to the player. Remember how Anders said that technology has already outpaced human comprehension? You're never told what your original job was. You're never told where the facility is, what you're producing, what you're making, or even when the game takes place. Maps don't help either, so you don't even know where you are at any given time. Heck, you don't even get to see the results of the big decision you have to make in the game. You just flip a switch. Hours of lore and world building leading up to install update, yes or no? With no hint of how your decision affected anyone. The surge constantly makes you feel like a small, confused cog in a large system that you can barely keep up with and then forces you to adopt machines just to survive. But maybe this sounds too far-fetched. Like, of course the story is dark, it's just another Dark Souls staple. Bleak, hopeless worlds full of sad characters and stories. Deck 13 just wanted to write a crazy worst-of-the-worst-case scenarios. <sighs> Take a look at this quote from Valve Software's Gabe Newell. Newell gave a New Zealand news outlet an interview about where he sees future technology like VR and brain-computer interfacing and where he would want to take that tech. Sleep will become an app you run, where you input, I need this much sleep, this much REM. Instead of fluffing pillows or taking Xylopen, I'll just say, this is how I want to sleep right now. From there, satisfied users will tell their friends about, say, sleeping through 12-hour flights completely refreshed with my circadian rhythm. That's right, the guy that made Half-Life wants to hook up your brain to an app to regulate your sleep. I cannot stress how bad of an idea that is. Oh, and the Surge predicted this too. Creo's not just a company, it's a way of life. Here you're not just seen as anybody, you're somebody, somebody special. At Creo, we have your well-being at heart, and that includes body and mind. Creo's more than just a job. Here, your family. Here, your home. But you want more, right? Why pay for expensive gym and spa memberships when Creo has state-of-the-art facilities right here? And, 
As for vacations, what if I told you you can have one every week? That's right. With Creo's Dream Tour Systems, or DTS, you can go anywhere in the world and even beyond. DTS feeds directly into your neural interface, and voila! You're on a beach in Rio, or Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Something more cultural? How about a stroll along the scene in beautiful Paris? Or what about enjoying the Colosseum during the height of the Roman Empire? That's right. DTS can fill all your desire. Enjoy a two-week vacation in less than an hour with DTS. Wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do, is just a click away. With so much to offer, why would you ever leave? Tech moguls like Newell are so deep in Promethean shame that they've come out the other side and are disdainful of anything biological. The Promethean shame has morphed into a kind of Promethean pride. Newell, in the same interview, called the human body a meat peripheral and said, You're used to experiencing the world through I, but eyes were created by this low-cost bidder who didn't care about failure rates or RMAs. If your eye got broken, there was no way to repair anything effectively. It totally makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, but it's not at all reflective of consumer preferences. Like, what are you talking about? The miracle of the human eye just doesn't cut it for consumers, huh, Gabe? It's big talk from a guy who had corneal transplant surgery. Remember, giving more of our autonomy to machines means giving our autonomy to the people and corporations who make and maintain those machines. The surge shows exactly what can go wrong. I'm getting worried about Ed. Ever since we started to implant team members with neural links, he's lost it. And yes, we checked and rechecked his implant. I'm worried he's having some kind of psychotic break. He's becoming totally divorced from reality. We've been in human testing for over a year. I mean, we're the development team and he's our software solutions lead. But he insists that his thoughts aren't his own, that someone's there with him. Creepy stuff, but nuts, right? In a final twist to all this, Anders was not envisioning social media and trying to warn us of it. He couldn't have imagined a world of cell phones, TikTok, Alexas, or iPads. Anders was actually writing about the dangers of atomic energy. People enjoyed luxuries once thought the realm of science fiction. Domestic robots, fusion-powered cars, portable computers. That's right, Anders was trying to warn us against the prologue of Fallout 4. But I think it's telling that Anders' warnings are just as powerful when applied to social media and our own modern world. The system that humanity has put in place to run our daily lives are so far beyond an individual's comprehension that the only response is to do your best to assimilate into that system. How can we escape our fate as a cog in a machine of our own creation? Mankind has always used tools, and those tools have always outperformed an individual person. The plow turning a field in an afternoon, the axe felling a tree in a few swings, the cart hauling dozens of trips worth of goods, the telegraph transmitting information in moments, all of these faster or stronger than a normal human. But with every advancement comes questions. How should I plow to maintain the mountainside? Which trees do I cut down, and which do I leave for the forest? How much weight can my horse pull before exhaustion? What news, and how to phrase it, should be delivered? All tools and technology raise questions of use. Aristotle wrote that virtue is the midpoint between two extremes in vice. If Anders warns of Promethean shame, and to go full Gabe Newell is Promethean pride, then the midway point is the cure, Promethean humility. Look, I get the irony of researching, writing, and producing an episode criticizing technology while using said technology. My MacBook has been giving me dirty looks this whole time. I think, it's, it's hard to tell. A lot of technological advances have made areas of life easier, but maybe a little bit of inconvenience is the price we pay for not being slaves to our own machines. 
If Starbucks could replace all their baristas with beverage dispensers, they would, in a heartbeat. They would say it would lower prices and ensure that every cup is perfectly made every time. But none of those dispensers would see that you're having a rough day and give you an extra shot of vanilla. Or know that you come by and order the same drink every day but forgot your wallet this time so this one's on the house. Or recommend a new flavor you might like. Those dispensers definitely wouldn't have small talk about local goings on while your drink is prepared. Technology can outperform us in how things are done, but technology is useless in determining why things are done. Promethean humility would be recognizing what machines do superior, but also knowing when, how, and why to use those machines, and when not to. Anders warns that we feel shame because we are rough drafts in a world of final copies. But he forgot that not only do final copies come from rough drafts, but that the rough draft is the fun part. That's where all the freedom is. That's where the voice is found. The world isn't a final copy. It's always a rough draft. It's grim, and Gunter Anders and The Surge are trying to show us that we need to make some significant, even painful edits to the story. But let's not lose hope. We can still make those edits, because technology might make things easier or faster, but only humble Prometheans can make things better. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and like if you want to see more. Check out more videos and streams on YouTube or Facebook by searching for Riff Arcade. We publish new videos every Monday, Wednesday, plus a stream every Thursday.